When Henrietta King was eight years old, she labored on a plantation in West Point, Virginia. As a slave, Henrietta was horribly underfed, later recalling that the amount of food that her mistress gave her wasn't enough to feed a swallow. Like many in her situation, Henrietta was kept to a point of near starvation. After all, most slave owners aimed to squeeze as much profit out of their slaves as possible and didn't want to waste money on feeding a nutritionally balanced diet. And Henrietta didn't have a father like some of the other enslaved children to bring her anything to eat. She relied on scraps from the kitchens. One day, on her way to empty her mistress's chamber pot, the young Henrietta noticed a peppermint sitting on the washstand. But it wasn't just a peppermint, it was a test, one that Henrietta would fail and pay the price dearly for. She initially resisted, knowing that the consequences would be dire if she gave in. Then one morning, I so hungry I can't resist. I went straight in there and grabbed that stick of candy and stuffed it in my mouth and chew it down so quick so old Miss has never find me with it. When Henrietta's mistress noticed the missing peppermint, she questioned her immediately. Out of fear, Henrietta lied, saying, Please, missus, please don't whoop me. I ain't seen no candy. I ain't took it. Her mistress, outraged, began to whip her. Henrietta thrashed back and forth until her mistress grabbed her and pinned her down, placing her head under her rocking chair. Her mistress called her daughter and began to rock back and forth upon the young Henrietta's skull. At the same time, her daughter beat Henrietta with a cowhide. This went on for an hour, until Henrietta's jaw was completely crushed, her teeth shattered, and her face permanently disfigured. Once the beating was done, a doctor was called in to examine Henrietta's mouth, which couldn't open and slid constantly to the right, but nothing could be done. Over a peppermint, the eight-year-old Henrietta had been beaten to the point of disability. Her mistress was so disgusted by her appearance that she sent her away. Henrietta recalled that babies would cry when they looked at her. For the rest of her life, she was unable to chew and subsisted solely off of liquids, stews, and soups. This level of senseless violence was commonplace for enslaved people living in the South. As an institution, slavery had to be maintained constantly with the threat of violence, sale, and death. That aspect of the slave trade is well known. Yet, one aspect of slavery has escaped common discussions. When discussing the brutal violence of slave owners, we are often confronted with the same picture. A white overseer or slave owner standing over his plantation, whip in hand, while his wife sits delicately on the porch, observing as he commits atrocities onto the enslaved, but rarely partaking in those atrocities herself. A passive bystander. Patriarchy tells us that women, especially white women, are inherently nonviolent, gentle, and passive. But examples like that of Henrietta King's, told on her own terms once she was free, show us a different picture. It shows us that white women were active participants in the horrors of slavery at every echelon, from the slave markets to the plantations. Based on Stephanie E. Jones Rogers' illuminating work, they were her property, white women as slave owners in the American South, this video will discuss the long-neglected role of white female slave owners, dispelling misconceptions regarding the gendered nature of slave ownership. In the 1850s and 1860s, census data revealed that white women made up about 40% of all slave owners. Historians have generally focused upon the records of slave owners for which we have extensive documentation in the form of diaries or letters. However, this focus has obfuscated the realities of many. Those who were literate were typically a part of the elite and owned large groups of enslaved people. But history tells us now that the majority of slave owners owned 10 people or less. The relationship between white women and slavery was at the foundation an economic one. Why did white women own slaves? To profit. Southern white women had huge economic stakes in the institution of slavery. Many may assume that women's disenfranchised status prevented them from owning slaves in their own right. Generally, we believe that a woman's only avenue to financial stability during this time was marriage. And for many, this was true. However, it was not uncommon for white men to be indebted or even dependent on their wealthier wives.
In fact, eligible white girls could increase their chances of marrying if they owned slaves. Marrying a propertied woman was a way for downtrodden men to improve their prospects. Jones Rogers writes, simply by marrying a woman with property, even if she maintained control of it, a man could improve his position. Legal petitions are on record in which women describe themselves as their husband's creditors and financers. This demonstrates that white women in the antebellum South could own slaves in their own right. Enslaved men, women, and children were given to young daughters as gifts for baptisms, birthdays, and marriages. Parents went to extreme lengths to ensure that the human property would stay in their daughter's hands and not fall into the hands of a future husband, or even worse, his creditors. Some slave-owning parents tended to give their daughters female slaves, partially because they believed that female slaves would be of more use in the domestic sphere, but also because female slaves had the potential to be more lucrative in the long run due to their childbearing capabilities. The practice of intergenerational slave ownership began when daughters were only infants. For example, Jones Rogers writes, In 1836, when Mary Fuller Knight was eight months old, her father executed a deed of gift that gave her an enslaved female named Rose, as well as any children that Rose might have in the future. Young white women learned how to be effective slave owners on the plantation. They closely observed their mother's management and discipline techniques. Recall that in the case of Henrietta, it was her mistress's young daughter who beat her while her mother pinned her down. Even as young girls, Southern women were assured of their racial superiority every day. They saw who was in the fields and who was not, who could be killed with impunity and who could not. Even aspects of Southern society as commonplace as salutations could be life or death for an enslaved person. Enslaved people were expected to refer to white children as master or mistress. If they forgot or refused, there was hell to pay. Rebecca Jane Grant, a former enslaved woman, did not call her mistress's three-year-old son master. One day, her mistress sent her to the store to receive a package. When she returned, she realized with horror what was in it. A cowhide strap, about two feet long. Her mistress pulled the whip out of the package and beat her viciously with it, yelling, You can't say Master Henry, miss? Here we can observe the psychological aspect of the terror that white female slave owners employed, making an enslaved person get the instrument for their own torture. When another formerly enslaved woman forgot to refer to her mistress's eight-month-old daughter as miss, her mistress put her in a stock and beat her, twisting her leg until it broke and continuing the beating thereafter. Another enslaved woman remembered that, when you called your master's children by their names, they would strip you and let the child beat you. It didn't matter whether the child was large or small. They always beat you till the blood ran down. This strict nomenclature served a purpose. It reinforced to enslaved people their inferiority, even to white children. This level of deference required in speaking to white people even children, ensured that enslaved people did not forget their place at the bottom rung of society. Frederick Law Olmsted, an American journalist, wrote on his travels through the South that he had seen a girl, about 12 years old, stop an old man on the public road, demand to know where he was going and by what authority, order him to face about and return to his plantation, and enforce her command with turbulent anger. When he hesitated, she threatened that she would have him well whipped if he did not instantly obey. The man quailed like a spaniel, and she instantly resumed the manner of a lovely child with me, no more apprehending that she had acted unbecomingly than that her character had been influenced by the slave's submission to her caprice of supremacy. No more conscious that she had increased the security of her life by strengthening the habit of the slave to the master race than is the sleeping seaman that he tightens his clutch of the rigging as the ship meets each new billow. The methods of violence employed to discipline enslaved people varied from owner to owner. Sometimes, daughters clashed with their mothers over the best way to manage enslaved people. Mary Armstrong's mother, enslaved by her mistress Polly, recalled her owner's cruelty. Armstrong stated that her owner Polly beat her nine-month-old sister to death because the baby wouldn't stop crying. 
After years, Polly's daughter Olivia came to own Mary Armstrong. When Polly tried to beat 10-year-old Mary the same way that she had beat her sister, Mary grabbed a large rock and chucked it at Polly's eye, leaving her howling in pain. Mary told her that was for whipping her baby sister to death. When Olivia found out, she only said, well, I guess Mama has learned her lesson at last. White female slave owners bought, sold, disciplined, and managed slaves. A part of this management often included sexual coercion. As aforementioned, slave-owning parents preferred to give their daughters female slaves, partially due to their reproductive capacity. After the abolition of the African slave trade to America in 1808, slave owners had to rely on a domestic supply of slaves. Therefore, owning slave women that would be forced to reproduce more labor could be more lucrative than buying at the slave market in the long term. Slave owner Emily Haiti forced both mother and daughter to engage in non-consensual sex with enslaved men so that they would both, quote, have babies all the time. Once they gave birth, Emily would sell the boys and keep the girls. There were instances in which formerly enslaved people did in fact say that their mistresses either sanctioned acts of sexual violence against them that were perpetrated at the hands of white men, or that they orchestrated instances of sexual violence between two enslaved people that they owned in hopes of producing children from those acts of sexual violence, Jones Rogers writes. She continues, Multiple generations of women could benefit from their elders' decisions to keep enslaved women and girls. Three generations of enslaved women in the Liner family served as nurses to Aaron and Frances Hudson Haney's female descendants. Lucy Liner nursed Aaron and Frances's daughter Anne. Lucy's daughter Patsy, in turn, nursed Anne's children. And Patsy's daughter Emma nursed the children of Anne's daughter Fanny. Generation after generation, slave-owning women benefited from the reproductive and maternal labor of the enslaved women that they owned. The dehumanization and exploitation of enslaved women's bodies was an integral part of white female slave owners' wealth. One enslaved woman would not or could not become pregnant. In reaction, her mistress stripped her naked and whipped her savagely. When this proved to be ineffective, her mistress sold the woman to slave traders. There was a variety of reasons that enslaved women would struggle to conceive. Being kept at the brink of near starvation, performing hard labor in the fields, and being subject to frequent beatings and torture. Legally, white female slave owners could exercise full and independent ownership over their slaves. When they faced challenges on their property, whether it be by their own husbands, debtors, or other slave-owning women, they went to great lengths to assert their property rights, and courts often sided with them. Slave-owning women had the authority to buy, sell, and brutalize their slaves as they saw fit. Here, it is key to differentiate between married women who lived in households with slaves and married women who owned slaves in their own right. Married slave-owning couples would have frequent arguments over how best to manage their respective properties. Formerly enslaved Morris Shepard stated that his old mistress inherited about half a dozen slaves and say they were her own, an old master can't sell one unless she give him leave to do it. If the husband insisted upon infringing on the property of the wife, the women could go to a chancery court and petition for justice. Sometimes these wives had bum husbands who were deeply in debt and being chased by creditors. These creditors would seize the wife's property, in the form of slaves, to pay the husband's debts. In these cases, the wives would bring the creditors to court and sue. Oftentimes, their property, in the form of slaves, was reinstated. Scholars of jurisprudence define ownership as a bundle of rights that an individual has to a thing. According to A. M. Honoré, that bundle includes the right to possess, the right to use, the right to be secure in one's property, the right to manage, which involves the right to decide how and by whom the thing owned shall be used, the right to the income of a thing, which includes the fruits, rents, and profits, the right to alienate the thing during life or on death by way of sale, mortgage, gift, or other mode, and the liberty to consume, waste, or destroy the whole or part of it. If someone infringed upon any of these rights, 
the owners could call upon a battery of remedies in order to obtain, keep, and if necessary, get back the thing they owned. Honoré was not referencing slavery in his essay, or if he was, he did not mention it. But when applied to slavery, this definition describes the position of 19th century Southern slave owners, an owner's near absolute right to discipline, maim, and even kill the enslaved people he or she owned, and the power to delegate management or discipline to others were the cornerstones of the institution. Slave-owning women exercised all the rights included in the bundle. Jones Rogers. When enslaved people spoke about their experiences, they made it clear that their female owners did not subordinate their authority to white men. Becoming a slave owner allowed a woman to access privileges that she wouldn't otherwise have. It was a form of wealth creation, which aided in marriage prospects and other realms of life. In the 1843 edition of The Southern Planter, a writer under the name Cecilia published an article discussing the management of slave labor. She wrote, Never scold when a servant neglects his duty, but always punish him, no matter how mildly, for mild treatment is the best severity hardens them. Be firm in this, that no neglect goes unpunished. Never let a servant say to you, I forgot it. Finally, let regularity mark every action, and the consequence would be that everything will be done in its right place and at its right time, and the comforts and happiness of the family will be secured. Slave-owning women were able to buy and sell slaves at auctions and even within their own homes. To protect their property from a prospective encroaching husband, women would make sure that the seller included a clause in the bill of sale that indicated the slave was, quote, her sole and separate property. That meant that in the eyes of the law, they exercised full ownership over their slaves and they were able to sell them as they pleased. An example of the freedom with which white women were able to maneuver in buying and selling slaves can be found in Charity Bowery. Charity Bowery was an enslaved woman on the Pembroke Plantation in North Carolina. She described her master, Mr. McKinley, as a kind man, but said that his wife, Mistress McKinley, was the devil. When Mr. McKinley died, he wrote in his will that Charity and her husband should be free. But Mistress McKinley neglected to mention that detail, and Charity's husband died in bondage. One after another, Mistress McKinley sold Charity's children to the slave traders. Charity labored hard as a washwoman to try to buy her children's freedom, but her mistress refused. In her own words, Charity told her story. One day, she sent me on an errand. I had to wait some time. When I come back, mistress was counting a heap of bills in her lap. She was a rich woman. She rolled in gold. My little girl stood behind her chair, and as mistress counted the money, $10, $20, $50, I see that she kept crying. I thought maybe mistress had struck her, but when I see the tears keep rolling down her cheeks all the time, I went up to her and whispered, what's the matter? She pointed to mistress's lap and said, brother's money, brother's money. Oh, then I understood it all. I said to mistress McKinley, have you sold my boy? Without looking up from counting her money, she drawled out, yes, charity, and I got a great price for him. Her mistress was a wealthy woman, who didn't need to sell Charity's son to survive. Yet, in the antebellum South, enslaved families could be torn apart at the drop of a hat. Slave-owning women would sell a child in order to buy a new dress. An important segment of the slave market that catered exclusively to white women was the enslaved wet nurse. While some Southerners were concerned that the enslaved's racial inferiority would seep into the breast milk, corrupting the child, Many women elected to purchase female slaves because nursing their own children made them feel, in one slave-owning woman's words, like a slave to their child. Thousands of advertisements can be found in Southern newspapers reading, Wet Nurse for Hire. White women routinely sought out and procured enslaved wet nurses to suckle their children, creating a demand for the intimate labor that such nurses performed in Southern homes. They were crucial to the further commodification of enslaved women's reproductive bodies through the appropriation of their breast milk and the nutritive and maternal care they provided to white children. 
The demand among slave-owning women for enslaved wet nurses transformed the ability to suckle into a form of skilled labor and created a largely invisible niche sector of the slave market that catered exclusively to white women. Jones Rogers. Oftentimes, in order to find a woman that was lactating, white female slave owners would tear black women away from their own infants and force them to breastfeed their babies instead. A crucial selling point in newspapers was to find a wet nurse without encumbrance, meaning without a child. In order to keep a steady supply of breast milk on hand, some white female slave owners would ensure that their female slaves became pregnant at the same time as them. For example, Emily Haiti, a white woman from Louisiana, owned Henrietta Butler. She forced Butler to have sex with a man on her plantation. The assault perpetrated against Butler resulted in pregnancy, and she gave birth to the child, who died shortly thereafter. While she mourned the loss of her baby, Haiti made Butler suckle her own infant. The lives of enslaved wet nurses were characterized by physical and sexual violence, loss, and grief. In response to the psychological terror exacted upon them, many women would fall into despair. Slave owners called this state the sulks. This was the description for the emotional state of mothers who had been assaulted, forced to bear children, sometimes even endured the death of their child, and then were forced to breastfeed their owner's child. For example, an advertisement in the City Gazette and Commercial Daily Advertiser on June 16, 1792, requested a black wet nurse who would, if possible, be free from the sulks and of good disposition. The infantilization of black people in the Deep South made it possible for white mothers to ignore the plight of black mothers. General ideas about black people suggested that they were innately cheerful and simple. When traumatized mothers displayed signs of grief, it was pathologized as a psychological aberration. It was common for white women to attend slave auctions. Since slavery was interconnected with practically every facet of life in the antebellum South, the buying and selling of enslaved people did not stop at the auction block. Some women preferred to conduct business in the comfort of their own homes. Either way, White slave-owning women took advantage of the opportunity presented to them to achieve greater financial freedom through property. Anne Robertson, for example, made a business out of buying six slaves for cheap, nursing them back to health, and then selling them for a profit. This was quite a risky business given that if the slaves happened to die, she would lose her investment entirely. Her husband John tried to keep her from engaging in such risky business, but she repelled his interference and said that the money was her own and that she would do as she pleased with it. Ultimately, Anne won the long game. She died considerably wealthy, with an estate worth more than 1,500 pounds and 27 enslaved men, women, and children. White women did not shy away from the raunchier aspects of the slave trade either. The fancy trade, as it was called, was the buying and selling of mixed-race enslaved women for the primary purpose of prostitution and concubinage. Matilda Raymond, for example, ran a brothel house in New Orleans, using enslaved light-colored women to serve as patrons. When her neighbor, Thomas Lynch, accused her of keeping a disorderly house that was the resort and residence of lewd and abandoned women, police arrested four of the enslaved women that were engaged in prostitution. Oftentimes, enslaved women laboring in brothers would be arrested and punished for engaging in prostitution, regardless of whether or not they were doing so against their will. Other documents from New Orleans show that an enslaved woman named Sarah was ordered to be whipped for the crime of keeping a house devoted to unlawful purposes. Yet her owner, Miss Bonseigneur, got off with a $25 fine, despite the likelihood that Sarah was forced to run the brothel by her owner. White Southern women fought bitterly to preserve the institution of slavery before and during the Civil War period. For many of them, redefining slaves as people rather than property caused huge economic losses. They would petition the government for reparations, writing to the president and demanding restitution for their lost property. In many cases, they received it. 
Some moved their slaves across state lines and even hid slaves away to prevent Union soldiers from being able to free them. Once all was said and done, some former mistresses, angry at their sudden misfortunes, sent their slaves away with nothing to starve and freeze in the streets. Jones Rogers writes, During the war, one formerly enslaved mother decided that it was time for her to make a break for freedom and take her two daughters with her. When she made the decision, one of her daughters was making clothing for the three of them. Learning of their impending plans, the mistress took the clothing off the loom and took it upstairs and hid it. Without suitable clothing, the enslaved family of three went away naked. Even after slavery was abolished, many former female slave owners tried to keep the institution alive. There are examples of slaves being held at gunpoint, forced to work under the same conditions as before the war. Some enslaved people died without knowing that they were indeed free. White slave-owning women held tight onto the institution because, as Jones Rogers astutely puts it, for them, slavery was their freedom. Without their lucrative property, some formerly wealthy white women became destitute. John Smith, a formerly enslaved man, recalled the situation. Some of the misses had <laughs> servants to bathe them, wash their feet, and fix their hair. When one <laughs> would wash the misses' feet, there would be another slave standing there with a towel to dry them for her. Some of these misses after the war died poor. Before they died, they went from place to place living on the charity of their friends. So, why did white female slave owners engage in the slave trade? The most important factor, money. But we can also find greater insight into the reasoning of these women through their diaries and letters. Some claimed to feel a sense of moral obligation, the white woman's burden. They reasoned that it was their duty, ordained by God, to civilize and rule over black people. Letitia Burwell, writer of A Girl's Life in Virginia Before the War, shared this sentiment. She writes, What courage, what patience, what perseverance, what long-suffering, what Christian forbearance must it have cost our great-grandmothers to civilize, Christianize, and elevate the naked, savage Africans to the conditions of good cooks and respectable maids? Culturally, ideology of religion and white supremacy aided in facilitating the slave trade. But the economic undercurrent incentivized white folk, men as well as women, to secure their investments and therefore their lives in the form of human property. Jones Rogers writes, Former slave-owning women's deeper and more complex investments in slavery help explain why, in the years following the Civil War, they helped construct the South's system of racial segregation, a system premised, as was slavery, upon white supremacy and black oppression. Understanding the direct economic investments white women made in slavery and their stake in its perpetuation and recognizing the ways that they benefited from their whiteness helps us understand why they and many of their female descendants elected to uphold a white supremacist order after slavery ended. If we acknowledge that white women stood to personally and directly benefit from the commodification and enslavement of African Americans, we can better understand their participation in post-war white supremacist movements and atrocities such as lynching, as well as their membership in organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Southern white women's roles in upholding and sustaining slavery form part of the much larger history of white supremacy and oppression. And through it all, they were not passive bystanders. They were co-conspirators.